Hi, today we've got another hot air station to take a look at. This time it's the Chinese Quick 857DW Plus and this is currently selling on Banggood for about $107. So fairly reasonably priced for a hobbyist level piece of kit. It has a 580 watt heater in the handle and interestingly you can buy replacement heaters for only $6 from Banggood which is really quite good. Uh, airflow it says up to 100 litres per minute. It comes with four different nozzles, so there's one fitted on the end and it comes with a bag of some extra ones. So three, six, eight and twelve millimetre nozzles. Output temperature from 100 to 450 degrees centigrade. And inside the blower is a brushless DC motor as opposed to the diaphragm pump that we saw in the Metcal unit. Now what I really quite like about this unit is the simple user interface. So as I said with the Metcal unit, I really don't like units where you have to keep pushing the up and down buttons in one degree increments. With this you've got the simple control all the way from 100 all the way up to 450, very quick. And the same with airflow, so it just sets it up and down without having to fiddle around with a load of buttons. Also this one does have a ability to go to sleep, so once it goes into the uh, cradle on the side of the unit, the unit starts cooling down and so it's not running at all times. There's not really anything on the rear of the unit. We've got a couple of vents here for the air that's coming into the hot air station to be blown out the nozzle. It has a fuse, the rating label, and my only main criticism of this product, it has a fixed mains lead, which has a couple of disadvantages. Firstly, you're fixed in terms of the amount of cable that you can have. So if I was to have this as a permanent fixture on my desk, I probably would disconnect this and have a IEC connector mounted on the back instead. The other problem is, Depending on how your bench is set up, especially in the UK with our slightly larger plugs, if it sits against the wall or something like that, you can't actually feed this down the back of your bench. Whereas with an IEC connector, you can sort of poke it up behind and then plug it in. So it makes uh, putting this on your bench a little bit more difficult, but really uh, not a huge problem. Here we can see the actual rating plate, 220 volt AC, 580 watts. So that presumably includes the blower as well. It does have a uh, sort of authenticity sticker and as we can see made in China. Not really anything to note on the underside just that we've got a couple of anti-vibration mounts for the blower so let's take a look inside. So here we have the insides of the unit. Not too bad in terms of construction. We've got the mains coming in at the bottom direct with the cable and it looks like there is enough room to squeeze a little IEC connector in there if I wanted to modify this. It goes straight into the fuse and then off to the PCB and then it comes back again from the PCB to go to the mains transformer which is driving the motor and the electronics. So we've got a 27 volt AC and a 10 volt AC winding on here. The brushless DC motor is clearly something like a 24 volt DC motor and the only thing that's powered from the mains after these two parts is just the mains heater. We've also got an earth lug onto the chassis I'm not quite sure why they've soldered the earth lead onto the earth lug sort of backwards but not the end of the world it has got a shake proof washer on there and as you saw it was locked tighted on as well. The one thing that I don't like from first glance is that the AC stuff is bundled together with the low voltage wiring and the low voltage wiring tends not to have an appropriate insulation level to be bound up with the mains wiring but since there's no accessible parts on here anyway um, you know in terms of low voltage electronics it's not a huge problem. Also what I've just spotted is the cable that goes down to the handpiece with the heater and everything in has this earth cable onto the chassis but this is very very thin and potentially would not survive the fault current if there was a phase to earth short in the handpiece or on the cable. The blower itself is mounted to these anti-vibration mounts so it does have a little bit of wobble there to try and reduce the noise that's coupled into the chassis. I think this looks quite similar to the one that we saw in the best station. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same or whether this one's a bit smaller, but it's got a similar general construction. So the air comes in here, gets blown around and out through the front panel. Construction of the main PCB is not too bad at all, really. I quite like it. We've got some higher grade Chinese capacitors here. So Jamicon brand, you've probably heard of them. They're slightly higher regarded than some of the others that you can get. Uh, we've got a whole load of diodes up here for the two windings on the transformer. So two full bridge rectifiers. We've got a regulator on the side here providing the power um, for the stuff on the PCB. 
got another little regulator here, presumably for the logic. On this part here, on the other side, we've got our three digit seven segment display. So you can see the three common drivers here. So there's probably common cathode drivers being fed straight from the STM8 microcontroller. At the bottom here, we've got the temperature sensor input from the handpiece going into an op amp. And that presumably just goes straight into a analog input on the STM8. We've got the programming header here. And then we've got the mains electronics on the side here. So we've got a triac. Uh, we've got the connector, which has the mains coming in and the mains going out to the heater. And then we've got just hiding underneath there, which you can't quite see with this camera angle. There is an optocoupler to allow it to be driven straight from the STM8. A closer look at the PCB, you can see generally speaking, all of the soldering that was done with the reflow soldering is really nice. All of the through hole parts have been soldered after the fact. And you can tell that really, there's a bit of flux residue, a little bit poor soldering here. The solder's not quite flowed properly around those pins, but certainly not the end of the world. A little bit of attention to detail here. So they've actually put some heat resistant sleeving on the legs of this wire round resistor, which is presumably gonna get quite warm. But they've added that there just so there's a little bit less chance of something shorting out on the leads because that resistor is spaced away from the PCB so that it doesn't start scorching the board when it gets hot. It, this looks like a snubber arrangement with the capacitor and the resistor to try and get rid of a bit of switching noise across the triac. It's a little bit of a shame that the capacitor is sat above the hot resistor, but these film resistors aren't affected in the same way as electrolytic capacitors are with heat. At the bottom of the front panel, we've got our power switch for switching the mains on and off. And we can see we've got the insulated fast on connectors onto this connector. So that's really nice to see that that's all been insulated up. Then we've got our little assembly here for feeding the air out to the handpiece and combining that with the electrical cable that's being fed through it. The handpiece is okay. It's probably the only bit that lets down this hot air station because it appears to be made from ABS or something similar. So it does feel a little bit plasticky. It's not quite as high quality as some of the other stations. It's got a reasonably nice um, little strain relief here and at the other end as well. And the actual tube length is about 600 millimeters. The nozzles attach with a little screw that I've just loosened and you can just take it off. And then inside here, you can see the heating element. I think when the unit arrived, the handpiece holder was loose in the box. And that means that you could Put it on either side of the unit you just switch around the screws you do have to switch around these four as well so that it's in the right position but then you can position it on either side according to your preference as a right-handed person i would typically have this unit on the right hand of my bench and therefore i'd actually have the holder on the left hand side so that when you go to grab it you're not dragging the hot air gun across the front of the unit with the potential to burn the front so let's have a little look at how the unit works. So when you turn it on and you've got the handpiece in the cradle, it displays what the set point temperature is. And any time that you twiddle the knob, you can immediately see what the set point is going to be. We'll set that to a nominal 230 degrees. And then we've got the airflow on the left here. So a little note about the power output of these units. So thank you for the comments on the Metcal video. I do appreciate those comments and do enjoy reading them and some really interesting points raised. Now, these units are usually designed, and they should be designed, we'll test in a minute, so that at the maximum airflow and the maximum temperature, the heating element is capable of delivering that at the tip of the hot air handle. If you're having trouble reflowing a part on a PCB and you're at maximum airflow and maximum temperature, for example, that probably suggests that that board needs preheating to raise the temperature because there is too much thermal mass on the PCB. Now, if you used a more powerful station, to get that power out of the nozzle, you'd have to turn up the airflow even higher. And even on the Metcal station that has a relatively low airflow, you're already blowing around components on the board at the maximum airflow. So it's almost useless to have a more powerful system. The only thing that it really accounts for on some of these units is the amount of time it takes to heat up. Now with the Metcal, like I said, once you turn it on, it's on. If you're no longer using it, then you turn it off. With these, it's triggered by taking the handpiece out of the cradle, and therefore you do want quite a quick warm-up time. You don't want to be waiting 10 seconds for your handle to start getting hot. So that's where the higher powered heating elements really play their part. So let's take it off the cradle and we'll get a sense for how loud this unit is. We'll start on the lowest airflow. And I don't know if that's coming across on video, but this unit 
is basically silent on the lowest airflow. Let's turn it up to maximum. And here we can hear a bit more noise. Less airflow noise than the Metcal, but a lot more motor noise from this one. It does just sound like a motor that's running in the unit. It's very smooth running. There's not really any PWM noise like there is on the best hot air station. When you put it back in the cradle, it cools down. I think it went, when it gets to about 100 degrees, that's when it shuts off the blower. Right, so I shoved a thermocouple slightly up the end of the nozzle. Um, it's a little bit elevated in terms of temperature just from that preheating from before. Let's see what happens when we power it up. So it's set to 100. Slight overshoot there. And it looks like it's settling about 18 degrees high. Let's see what happens if we turn the airflow right down. So not quite as well regulated as the Metcal. Let's turn the temperature up to the full 450 and see what happens. Quite slow to climb compared to the temperature that it's reporting. So it doesn't actually look like it's going to get there. Let's turn up the airflow. Maybe that will heat it up a bit quicker. So about 10 degrees out at the highest temperature with full airflow. If we turn it back down again, let's see. No, it's definitely dropping with the lower fan speeds. I guess there's a little bit of temperature differential between the end of the heater and the nozzle, but we did not see that on the Metcal unit. So a little bit of calibration error there. I'm not quite sure why it can't reach the higher temperature at the lower airflow. You would think it would be the other way around. Now you typically have it set somewhere around 230, 240, something like that. Let's see if it's quite happy around there. And I've actually only just spotted it, but you can see the little decimal point that's blinking there is indicating when the heater is actually active. So it's blinking on and off there, suggesting that it's being PWM'd at this point. And we're just reading a little bit high on the output here. Let's turn up the airflow and see if it's still stable. Uh, no, we're about 45 degrees out. So that's a little look at the Quick 857DW. Personally, I really do like this unit. I think the form factor is really nice. The price point is pretty good. It's definitely a lot better than those generic hot air stations that you can see uh, all over the place for about 30 or 40 pounds. So I think it is definitely worth paying a little bit extra for this unit. The construction looks pretty good. It's almost silent apart from when it's at the higher airflows, but really quite inoffensive. The main problem is that the temperature control is not accurate. So you will end up still using visual feedback to go, well, it's not quite doing what I need it to do. I need to tweak it up or down. And you wouldn't just rely on the number that is being displayed. And half the time, that's the case anyway with a hot air station. I know that uh, a lot of people like to have that visual feedback, but it doesn't mean a great deal. Once you're blowing hot air onto the board, whether you're blowing 220 degree air or 280 degrees air, it doesn't make a huge difference. In fact, you want your temperature reading to be what the board is, not what the hot air coming out of this station is. You just want to make sure that you haven't accidentally set it to 400 degrees so it completely melts everything in its path. But again, you'll be looking at the board and seeing what's going on. I do really like the user interface on this, generally speaking. So I do like the two knob control. Very quick to make adjustments. Uh, and this is sort of my preferred control layout. I really don't want to have to have lots of buttons that are a bit fiddly to set. Even with the presets on some of the units, you have to go through a process of setting those up in the first place, whereas you can just set these to where you remembered before and make little adjustments as and when. So I hopefully you found the video interesting. I'll put a link to this product in the description down below. And don't forget to look out for discount codes if you are thinking about buying this unit. Later on this week, we'll be looking at the big brother of this. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And until next time, thanks for watching.